Hi, this is a nursing professor. Welcome to Fundamentals on Friday. This is where I take a chapter that I actually taught this week and I break it down and give you the highlights in about five or six minutes. So let's stay tuned for that. If you know any other fundamental students or any other nursing students, as well as nursing assistants, please feel free to share this with them because this is very useful. So I use the reference point of having six vital signs. First one is temperature. Okay, so that's where we're evaluating the body temperature. And so there's several ways that we can get body temperature. One most common is orally. If the person can hold a thermometer into their mouth, that's a good way of taking it. But they must be able to hold it in their mouth. So anybody with any kind of facial industry, um, injury or someone who can't follow directions, that won't be the uh, preferred way for them. Next, we'll talk about the tympanic. Tympanic is another simpler way of being able to get uh, body temperature. And that's when you have that device that goes right into the um, uh, ear right here. It goes in about a half an inch. And you want to make sure that if you're using it on an adult, that the earlobe literally goes up and back. On children, it could be up and out or up and down, depending on the um, way the earlobe is actually uh, designed. You just want to make sure that that device is inside of the um, uh, tympanic space in order to get a really good measurement. All right. Next would be temporal. That is the device that goes across the forehead. It's nice and quick and easy, less invasive, and great for people who might be a little fussy. You know, children, people with um, some patients with developmental delays, things like that, that they don't like invasive type of procedures. That's an easy way of getting a person's uh, temperature. Now, uh, axillary is another way, but you must not, the person cannot have on clothes like this. They cannot. It needs to be measured by skin to skin. So that's going to mean the side of the person's body underneath the axilla or armpit. And then they're able to hold their arm like this for two to sometimes even three minutes because uh, you must be able to do that in order to get a temperature that's even somewhat accurate because if there's space in between there, it's, it's no good. The most reliable way of getting a temperature is rectal. And with rectal temperatures, then you want to make so, make sure someone's in the SIMS position that's turned on your left side with the top leg up towards the bent towards the belly. You want to always have lubricant and you're going to insert the thermometer, which usually is color coded and red. And you insert that about uh, an inch into the rectum and then you're able to get that temperature. It is the most reliable because it's there's no environmental interference with that. It didn't matter if that person just had something to drink. It didn't matter if the room is hot or cold or any of those things that could um, make the other uh, forms of assessing temperatures um, have a little bit of variation to them. All right, so next on our list would be pulse or heart rate. Now, normal for an adult is anywhere between 60 and 100. There are tons of things that can influence a person's pulse, including medications, if they just finished exercising and all the things, all right? And so to take someone's pulse, then we're gonna use the radial side, which is where the thumb is, and we're actually gonna take the pulse there. The most accurate way of getting a pulse measurement is the apical pulse. To get to the apical pulse, you're gonna look at the mid-clavicular line. You're gonna go between the fourth and fifth intercostal space. You have your stethoscope in your ears, diaphragm onto that spot, and you're able to actually hear the heart rate at its, uh, the heartbeat at its um, crispest sound. So you're gonna get the most uh, accurate measurement that way. Uh, respirations, you don't want anybody to know when you're actually counting respirations. And we do want to count them for a full minute to see if there's any irregularity there. So you're watching the rise and fall of a person's chest. You, If I, they had on as many clothes as I have right now, having a t-shirt and a jacket, then you probably want to take the jacket off so you literally can see the rise and fall of that person's chest. Blood pressure, blood pressure 
It's so important and it takes practice if you're trying to get one that is um, manually. You must have the right size cuff. That cuff needs to wrap all the way around the upper aspect of the arm. You need, to, If you're doing manually, you need to listen right in the center of the intercubital there, that space there, that is where the brachial artery is. You will listen there and you will get the person's um, blood pressure. Remember it's systolic over diastolic. Systolic is when that heart is actually contracting and diastolic is when it is at rest. A normal blood pressure for an adult ranges. Uh, we usually look at something like 90 over 60 as the low end and 120 over 80 as the high end as to where we want someone to be. That variation can be different depending on your individual. So check your facility or check your book as to what they want you to know. All right, oxygen level, we get that from a pulse ox. That's a little machine that goes on your finger. Make sure it's a clean finger, no nail polish, so that you can get an accurate reading. Anywhere between 95% and 100% is considered normal for an adult. Pain, pain is the sixth vital sign. We should always assess pain because pain, if a person has it, is gonna impact all the rest of the vital signs. Blood pressure is gonna be up. Um, Heart rate's going to be up. Respirations can even be up in the event that a person is in pain. And if that, uh, if we use a scale of say between zero and 10, 10 being the worst pain that you have, if we get a number four above, that person really should be uh, medicated or given some sort of heat or ice or some sort of therapeutic relief from having pain levels that are greater than four. And remember, pain is subjective and we believe what the patient says. That's not for you to determine. If they say they're in pain, they are in pain. All right. All right. So things that do affect our vital signs, um, age, babies, heart rate beating, beating, beating fast, and we don't need to be concerned about that, all right? But if it's an adult that has a heart rate of 140, we're like, hey, wait a minute, that's, that's, that's a little tachycardia there, and we need to find out what actually is going on. Activity level, if you're outside exercising, heart rate's gonna go up, blood pressure typically will go up. Medications can have side effects. Um, stress, when we're stressed, everything wants to rise. Illness, pain. Um, and the environment. All of those are potential uh, influences on our vital signs and we must consider those. All right, so we always want to report whenever the vital signs are outside of normal. And when we report, we want to give a full set of vital signs, not just, hi, the, the blood pressure is up high. What else is going on with that person's heart? Perhaps the heart rate's up too, or, or perhaps the heart rate's too slow. So we need to report a full set of vital signs. We want to report any sudden changes, any deteriorating conditions. So along with the change in vital signs, we want to tell what that patient actually looks like. So vital signs are only a part of an assessment. And also remember this, for you all that are in school to be licensed nurses, you cannot, cannot delegate an assessment. What you can do is that you could tell your technician or your nursing assistant to get you a set of vital signs and bring them back to you. But that is not their role to actually do any type of assessment on that, okay? All right, then of course you got to document. If it's not documented, not done. All right. And you want to be able to document such that five years later, when somebody decides to sue, that when you go back and take a look at your notes, you know exactly what you were doing at that time and how thorough that you really were. So when you document exact vital signs, the time, the observation, uh, what's going on with your patient and any intervention that you might have done. We usually like to use the communication tool of SBAR. S stands for the situation. Describe the situation that your patient currently has. B, we're going to give them a background as to what's actually happening with the patient. A is our assessment, which should include vital signs, and R is any recommendation. This is an excellent tool for communicating with your doctors, um, also with communicating on paper so that the multidisciplinary team actually know what went on when those vital signs were abnormal. To handle vital signs require critical thinking because you need to paint the whole picture. It's not just a set of numbers and any, any abnormality should be reported and should be further assessed. So that is the chapter on vital signs in nine minutes. All right, I will see you next Friday where we'll talk about another chapter in Fundamentals of Nursing. 
bye for now and please like share comment down below uh this is really good i know it's really good for fundamentals of learning students and uh, nursing assistants uh in and as i said anybody in nursing school so i will see you next video bye for now Thank you.